Uh, we are going to go really quick tonight and we're going to cover, particularly this is, it's not just archaeology, we're talking biblical archaeology. As the, most of the discoveries in this room some way impact upon this old book. And what I, what I really love are the prophecies and predictions. And tonight we want to go and we're going to end our meeting with some of the just incredible predictions that the Dead Sea Scrolls have revealed to us and shown us. Tomorrow night, I want to take you to Babylon. We have to go via the Berlin Museum because the, the English and the Germans and everyone else in Europe stole most of these artefacts uh, back very early and have them set up. And I'll show you a little bit of that tonight. But tomorrow night, we want to go to ancient Babylon and see one of the major predictions that was found in this book. So tonight, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of some of the major discoveries that impact biblical archaeology, and I particularly want to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls and have a look at some of those. Any hard questions or anything, you just ask Ben or Alex, and they'll, they'll answer them for you. But I am, uh, I am, by training, a theologian. I've worked as a pastor for 20 years. And I used to do this sort of stuff, talk on this and travel the world full time once and I don't get to do this much anymore. So this will be fun for me tonight. I haven't done this for a few years. But uh, no matter what faith or background you come from, we just love everyone coming and really getting confirmed for us that God has spoken through the Bible. That's basically what I'm going to confirm to you tonight and everything we do. So can I take you quickly... Uh, because they took 15 minutes of my time, I'm not going to waste any time. The destiny of Egypt, how it's ended up today, it was actually written down and found in a cave. And that's where I'm going to end the meeting tonight. I'm going to show you what it said in that cave about what would happen to Egypt. But first, we need to go to Egypt and have a look. Can I see the hands of those that have been to Egypt? A few. It's really got dangerous. And I'm not in a hurry to go back. I had some really bad experiences on my last trip. But if you can get through all that with all the chaos that's happened since the Arab Spring and the, and the disintegration of their country, it is an absolutely incredible place. And this, of course, is the Pyramids of Giza. They are the most famous of all. They were built by a father, a son and a grandson. Uh, Pharaoh Khufu, Khafre, and uh, he's, his name's pronounced several different ways. Menkaru, that, that, they do it all sorts of different ways. But these three pharaohs are most famous for building just incredible structures there, right near Cairo. There's been 138 pyramids found in Egypt. Most of them are not impressive. Most of them you wouldn't actually travel anywhere to see. They actually experimented a lot and had a lot of mistakes. And until they got what they call the Great Pyramid, this monument, which today if we had to build that, if you take that pyramid and cut it down into one foot square blocks and you put those blocks side by side, you can go right around the coastline, not just of New South Wales and Queensland, but you can get the whole coastline of Australia side by side twice. Twice. By the way, check out anything I tell you. If you don't believe me, go and check that out. It covers five hectares. It is just the most incredible structure. It was once covered in pure white uh, slate that is no longer on it. It's been stolen. You can see on, the, on Caffrey's pyramid, there's still a little bit at the top. There are 2,300,000 separate blocks. Biggest one is 15 tons. Those, how they built that, it's, it's 146 metres high. It's actually a little lower than it originally was. For around 3,800 years, it was the highest man-made structure on Earth. We've, we've outdone that now with our skyscrapers, but for 
Over 3,000, nearly 4,000 years, that was the highest building ever built in the world. And to go there, uh, it's just incredible. Down the front here is a friend that I kind of met on the way from Jordan. <laughs> Be careful if you go to Egypt. I got on a camel there. See that camel? That guy with the camel? He let me get on that camel for $20. Now that sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? It was 100 bucks to get off again. Be careful about getting on a camel. Uh, it was a hundred bucks to get off, and, and, and the guy's got to make a living. Fair enough, but I, I didn't have a hundred bucks. My friend from Jordan got me out of trouble. Um, to walk around, it's over a kilometre to walk around the base of that. It, it is something to behold. I would love that we could all travel there and just say, wow, we, we think that we're so advanced today. We've got all our lights and computers and everything. These guys built this in under 20 years. I think it could have been done, in fact, in 14 years. If we had to do that today, that size, we're pretty sure we couldn't. Um, it is square on its four sides to within 58 millimetres. I've not measured it, I have to rely on people that have. Every corner of that pyramid is exactly north, south, east and west. And in order to build it the size and the dimensions they have, they had to know the mathematical equation of 2 pi r. And the way, they've dated this to around 2,500 BC that it was originally built. So it's just something to behold. And of course, that's only a part of what you can see in Egypt. You can actually go inside. That is a, a, an entry that was not supposed to be there. The real entry is up high. You can see on the top of the screen, but they, uh, Mahmoud's entry, they call it, where they've just broken into the pyramid to, uh, to make it easier to access. And you can go there today and pay extra money and get to go inside. What you don't often see in the pictures is how close this is to the city. And if you look back from the pyramid, you can see the smog of Cairo. It is an incredibly polluted place. Love the people in Egypt, the people living in Cairo, their bread and stuff they cook, it's, they're fantastic. But boy, the traffic is something else. And uh, that they fit millions of people right there, living right beside these ancient monuments. Inside the, uh, the actual pyramid when you go inside you can go right up to the uh, great chamber up to where they buried that's a grand gallery the king's chamber the queen's chamber all of this was covered in limestone it, it, you can't describe what this must have been in its day we see it as a broken down old monument and we're in awe how it would have looked when it was first built would be incredible. A lot of people want to know why you build the pyramids. Were they calling UFOs or uh, all that sort of stuff? It's a burial chamber. Probably had something to do with their concept of the afterlife. It's very debated about a resurrection and afterlife that the Egyptians sought. But these pharaohs built this as a monument to be buried in. And when they buried them, they put a whole lot of goodies in there that everyone else wanted. And it became obvious that building a pyramid to bury yourself in with squillions of dollars worth of gold is not a good idea because everyone that wants gold, they know where it is. And so they changed. That was uh, uh, the fifth dynasty that were building those things. By, we get, by the time we get down to the 18th dynasty, they moved where they buried the pharaohs. They moved from up at Giza in the pyramids all the way down the Nile to Luxor and to a place called the Valley of the Kings, five or six hundred kilometres apart. I drove between those two places last time at night time. Bad idea. <laughs> they don't keep the headlights on over there. They use the street lights to see everything and when they see another car, they flick the lights. They are incredible drivers. I couldn't drive like that and I actually got so freaked out that I had to lay on the floor and not look because <laughs> we'd be screaming down the road 
and the guys would just flick the lights and here's a donkey right in the middle of the road and we're doing 100 k's an hour and you, he didn't even have the lights on. But uh, I became, I don't know why an Egyptian has not won the Formula One Grand Prix, I tell you, that they're amazing drivers, they're amazing drivers. And this is the Valley of the Kings, incredibly dry and barren, hence it's a perfect place to preserve things. And the 18th dynasty of the pharaohs, this is where all the big guys ended up. And to go there today is quite an incredible thing to get a, a feel for, for what it's like. It looks just like a, a pretty dry old wasteland, but inside those tombs that they dug out of the side of the mountain, they buried incredible riches. We would not have known about those riches except for that great discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. How that came about is fascinating. And it came about because they were able to read hieroglyphics. Can anyone here read hieroglyphics? I can't either. But uh, the way they discovered the hieroglyphics led to uh, not just the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, but the discovery of just some amazing other things that I'll come to in a moment. You go to some of these temples and over all the walls, for, for centuries, people would go there from the West and see all this and they'd think, aren't they lovely pictures? Well, no, they're actually writing. They're explaining things. But because the writing was so ancient, no one, it was just lost to history. No one could work it out. No one could see what they were saying and everywhere you look in Egypt are these incredible, beautiful, uh, all of this is words. It's not just decoration. It's telling a story. It has a lot of meaning. But no one could work out what the meaning was until they discovered the Rosetta Stone. By the way, which country discovered the Rosetta Stone? It was the French. And one of Napoleon's... Uh, soldiers that were out there it was actually being used in a fort it had been taken out of a wall it came from um, they discovered it in 1799 AD the French the British had it by 1801 they won a battle with the French and so the British took it back and that's a picture from the British Museum you can see the the copy of it there the real one is about that thick solid granite uh, it is the key that unlocked the hieroglyphics. And the way that came about was, uh, was pretty incredible. You can see it there. It was in a temple originally. It had been taken out of that temple probably a couple of hundred years later or a thousand years later, and it ended up in a wall of a fort. And the French found it and thought, this is great. They were going to take it back to France and they had a battle with the British, the British won, and so they got it, and it's still in the British Museum today. And in the British Museum, there are just uh, so many things to see, a lot of handsome people in the British Museum. <laughs> um, it comes from 196 BC, and I, I don't have time tonight to go into all the details of the Rosetta Stone. You could spend hours just on that, the Rosetta Stone, but here's the basic premise of how it worked. It came from uh, Ptolemy V, a young Grecian king that was in Egypt from 196 BC. Why it was so significant, it had three lots of writing saying the same thing. The hieroglyphics, which no one could read. The demonic script, which again, people were struggling with by that time. But what we could still read was Koine Greek. That's the Greek of the New Testament. And anyone that's learned a lot about the New Testament has to learn Koine Greek. So they eventually were able to work out what the Greek was saying and work back. And this very smart Frenchman was able to go backwards and work out what the two Egyptian scripts were saying. And by the time he had discovered that, we could go back now. It was really an alphabet. All those symbols represented letters in an alphabet. They were able to calculate and work out 
what was being said on all the walls. At this point, you're supposed to say, so what? Come on, say it to me. You say, big deal. Big deal. deal. Who cares? It's just an old rock. Well, it, it actually was a really big deal because all of a sudden, they were able to discover some amazing treasure. Let me take you back to the Valley of the Kings. In the Valley of the Kings... By the, r- roughly by the First World War, 1914, they had declared there was nothing left to be uncovered in that valley. Every single tomb they'd been in was empty. They found all the mummified pharaohs all shoved in a cave up the hill somewhere that the, the grave robbers didn't want to desecrate their bodies, so they actually even left their names on them. And they found all the pharaohs, and the pharaohs were taken down to Cairo, and they don't look real good anymore, but they were there. But there were no treasures and nothing about anything in there. And if you look at the list of kings, which they could now read, they realized there was one missing. They'd found every tomb. Now they could read the names of the pharaohs in the hieroglyphics, except for one. What was his name? If you're an Australian, you say Tut and Carmen. <laughs> if you're an Egyptian, you'd probably say it quite differently, uh, Tut and Hamon or something like that. But I'm an Australian, so I'll say Tut and Carmen. Tut and Carmen was missing. There was a, a, uh, a young guy who had gone over there when he was just 17 years of old called Howard Carter. Uh, he first went to Egypt when he was eight, in 1891. He'd worked with several different things. Uh, digs. Howard Carter was meticulous and Howard Carter realised there was one pharaoh missing and he, after the war, uh, he first started looking in 1907, it went to 1914, they had the First World War. 1917 he comes back and he's sponsored by a very rich Englishman named Lord Carnarvon. If you're a rich Englishman here tonight, please come and see me afterwards. It'd be just fantastic to be sponsored by a rich Englishman. He got sponsored by a rich Englishman. He went back down into that valley and for six years he searched and he searched. You couldn't search in the middle of summer. You can only search when it's reasonably cool. After six years, he had nothing. And Lord Carnarvon, he was rich, but he wasn't that rich. And he said, I can only give you one more year. So Howard Carter goes back and starts his dig. He's only a few days into that new season and one of his men find a step. You see, what happened? Ramesses VI has this uh, tomb up the hill here and when they dug that tomb out, they actually buried the entrance to Tutankhamun's tomb. And there was one spot left in the bottom of the valley that they decided, we better have a look there. Howard Carter does something so amazing. This is what I, 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 other stuff I can handle, I can't handle this. He finds a step. Everyone went silent when they saw that step. One step, they knew what they had. They dug down and they dug down, they removed it all, they removed it all. This is November 4th, 1922. They get down and here is the entrance to a pharaoh's tomb. And it was still sealed. All the others had the seals broken. It was still sealed. So you know what Howard Carter did next? He sends a telegram to England, to Lord Carnarvon, say, we've found it, come quickly. And then he filled it back in. Oh, I couldn't handle that. (laughs) He filled it back in. They would have guarded it. They didn't tell anyone what was going on. He filled it back in until Lord Carnarvon could get... He didn't have a a jet. He had to get on a boat from England and met all the way out to Egypt. And every night he had to wait and wonder and wonder. That's the bit of the story that I'm just blown. I would have broken it open and just had a quick look and then put it back together. But he left it, buried it. Carnarvon gets out here and they dig all the way down again uncover it, they come to the thing and they open the tomb and they look in here what they thought was for the first time in thousands of years. They break the seal and look in and they look into what's called the antechamber and thieves have been in there. 
It's been broken into, they've dug down into one spot. But someone must have caught them and they got them back out of there and they sealed it up again and no one ever got there again. So when they went into, and you can go there today and see all this, if, when they got into the out, outer part, the antechamber, this is now the 25th of November, that's how long it took to get from England, 4th to the 25th, about three weeks, they realised the stuff had been moved around and unsettled, but it was all still there. That's not the tomb proper, that's like the veranda to the house. <coughs> Howard Carter then removes all this stuff. Howard Carter is meticulous. He gets everything taken out of that big chamber, the antechamber, brings it out. That's what it looks like today. That's the steps they discovered that went down. It's not a very big hole down there, is it? That's an actual photo of the antechamber. And see that mark in the wall? Inside there is the real tomb. So they removed everything out of there meticulously and it's now the 17th of February. That's how long it took. Like, I would be so out of my mind wanting to know what's in there. For the first time in modern history, modern man got to actually open an Egyptian tomb. Tutankhamun. Was he a big pharaoh or a little pharaoh? He's nobody. We think now, they always said he got hit in the head, we think now he actually got run over by a chariot because his ribs and everything are messed up. They do all sorts of x-rays and CAT scans. They opened it up and inside, and by the way, over there, that wall is the actual wall. They're coming in from the other side. See the paintings on the walls there? They're the actual paintings that were actual. They're a copy of the, uh, they're a copy of the paintings of Tutankhamun's tomb. They broke through that wall over there. They're actually destroying all those lovely paintings as they're coming through this wall. They opened it up and they saw a big box of solid gold. And the rest, they say, is history. There was four massive boxes of gold and then there's a sarcophagus and inside the sarcophagus, there's four other gold coffins that got all the way down to the death mask. And what was uncovered, that's what it actually looked like coming into the antechamber and the tomb and the treasury over on the side. What they found there absolutely blew the world away. A little unknown pharaoh has got so much gold he could back the Bank of England. Just one little guy, young when he died. Uh, you can go to Cairo and see the actual exhibits or you can just come to Walls End and see the copies. <laughs> Take your choice. I see you chose Walls End. Uh, that's one of the coffins, so these gold coffins that go all the way down Everyone that uncover, meticulous in the way they did it. And that, my friends, I'm sorry, but the, the death mask as you walk in is not even close to how beautiful the real one is. That's a picture of the real death mask, solid gold that they placed on his head. Didn't help him much, but that's what they got. That was all because they were able to uncode decode the hieroglyphics and the, the chariot which is timber covered in gold, his gold covered throne, everything you could imagine was found there was just amazing. You say, what do you say? <laughs> big deal. Well if you had a founder it would be a big deal. Uh, I would just like a little bit of that death mask would do me that I'll be set for life who needs superannuation if you've got that this is a bit all that stuff's lovely lovely dovely this is the stuff that gets me going but it also uncovered amazing truth you know that the modern guys today actually dismiss the bible and anyone that believes in it is kind of like should be in a museum themselves you come and look at these artefacts and people that believe the Bible and take it seriously, they, you should be sitting in the corner over there with those pots. You're sort of an artefact. Let me tell you today that you can be an absolute intellectual thinking person and believe the Bible without a question. I'll show you why. 
Let me give you, and, and again, I, I have to go quickly. There's a whole lot of stuff that's been found in Egypt that will make a thinking person stop and really say, well, hang on, maybe there's more to that book than I've given it credit. Uh, here's some of the stuff that's been found. And again, I don't have time. I've got books and books on this. I'm just going to give you some of the highlights. You see this uh, Ben Hassan inscription. It was found, it was found uh, halfway between Cairo and Luxor in a little uh, cemetery, if you like. There's this tomb. And on the wall of the tomb is this incredible inscription. Why it's so incredible, have a look at the two people here. There's a difference in the color of their skin. The guys on this side, guess where they're from? They're Egyptian. Who are the other guys? We call them Hebrews. They've come down from Palestine to visit Egypt. And the leader of this group is wearing this big, colorful coat. Now, the story's in the Bible of... Uh, of uh, you remember the Bible story? Who was it that had the colourful coat? Joseph. Joseph. That's not Joseph. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'd never want to ever mislead anyone. I love to say, there's Joseph. It's not Joseph. But it shows you that in their culture, the important people, the honoured people, were given colourful coats. And that's exactly what Joseph gets, exactly from that. And this is the 19th century BC. This is the time of Abraham. This goes way back. And you can see these two different racial groups. And they're carrying weapons and the women and everything else. It all fits exactly with what you'd expect from that group of people that we later call the Hebrews or the Jews. And there they were, painted on the wall. Why that's so significant? Many people said Israel didn't even exist in ancient times. That was all made up later just to sound good. They were never really there. Here's another amazing thing. At the time of the Exodus, or, or sorry, not quite the Exodus, but before then when Joseph goes into Egypt, the people that were ruling Egypt, and this is relatively recently they've discovered this, was a different racial group, and they're called the Hyksos. What are they called? Hyksos. You're supposed to say big deal, the Hyksos. Why is it a big deal? A lot of people said, and, and that's a, a Hyksos palace in Egypt. I've taken that picture in Egypt. Why it's a big deal, the Egyptians didn't like to keep cattle, they didn't appreciate shepherds, unless you're the Hyksos. The Hyksos were cattle herders. They were, I'm not going to call them farmers, they were all farmers, but they were actually very close to what the Hebrews were like and they were ruling Egypt exactly at the time that Joseph becomes the prime minister. And all of a sudden, the Bible story makes complete sense. And I myself hadn't heard of those 20 years ago. And now when you go over to the museums and you visit there, they've found the palaces of the Hyksos. It all fits in exactly with the time that the Bible says that a Hebrew becomes a prime minister. And all of a sudden, that becomes very logical and believable. Um, there's all these accounts of when they fought against the Hyksos. And um, I, I don't want to get bogged down in this. And then there's Moses and the Exodus. By the way, we wish in the Bible it had said who the Pharaoh was at the time of the Exodus. But the Bible just wants to dismiss this guy. They just call him the Pharaoh. Oh, if only we got a name. We didn't get a name. A lot of people say it's Ramesses because the Bible says they built a city named Ramesses. I do not believe it was Ramesses. Just, by the way... I don't know who it was, I'm guessing. And if anyone tells you they know who it was, guess what? They don't know either. If only we knew. Here's some things I want to show you but that I think is amazing. I think I know who it is. This is a, a big uh, sign like the Rosetta Stone. It's called the Manepta Stella. Why the Manepta Stella is so groovy. Don't you think that looks groovy? Put up your hand if you think it's groovy. Come on, let me see the groovies. This is a groovy stone. Why this stone is so groovy, it is the first time in history outside of the Bible that the nation of Israel ever gets a mention. 
What year is it? Well, it's 1220. Uh, 1220 BC. All the skeptics say Israel didn't exist. Israel couldn't have been there. This stella, and by the way, this is a, in, a, in a Muslim country, there's a tiny little sign over on the wall. You walk past that and you don't think it means anything. It's the first reference in history to Israel. And it says the Egyptians just had a fight with them and they laid them waste. They were already a nation, 1220 BC. So we know the Exodus has to happen before that. The Bible gives us a date for the Exodus. Did you know that? Uh, the Bible date's actually rock solid and there's no problem. So the Bible date is 1450 BC, around about. So around 200 years later, the Egyptians are already having wars with Israel. So we know they must have been there. The slaves that are talked about in the Bible that are making bricks out of straw, everything just like the Bible described it, the more we dig, the more we find that confirms exactly that they were like. Here's another amazing thing. This is the, the time when the Exodus would have taken place. Notice something about the names of the pharaohs. Can you see what it is? Uh, they love a particular name. Moses was given an Egyptian name. And I think the Pharaoh of the Exodus, this is me, can I prove it? Nope. And if I tell you it is, you'll be able to find evidence that's not. I'll find evidence it is. But that's the guy there, okay? Don't even want to tell you any different. Top Moses the third. He was the greatest Pharaoh in all of history, the greatest soldier, the biggest armies, the biggest conqueror. And I think he drowned in the Red Sea. That's just me. Uh, I had it all worked out and then they messed up all the dates on me, so I gave up. First uh, Kings chapter 6, in, in the Bible, it tells us it was uh, exactly 480 years after the Israelites had come out of Egypt. You can work out, you might give a year or two one way or the other, but it's around 1450 BC that it has to happen. We know they're there by 1220 BC. You can be the biggest skeptic in the world and they're there. And this is the guy, Tutmosis III, that I think it was him. Um, we know that because uh, this great guy, uh, James Henry uh, Breasted, said that he died in March when he worked out all the calculations, March of that year. Now, the problem with the Egyptian dates is every couple of years they change them. I had this all worked out perfectly and then they changed all the dates. So that's why I can't say categorically. But here's the other amazing thing. He's the greatest pharaoh who ever lived. Go to his tomb and you'll discover one thing. It was never finished. They didn't even colour in the lines. It was done in a rush job. He was buried quickly and he didn't get to even finish his tomb. Nowhere near as good as Tutankhamun's tomb. And he was a far more powerful, far more wealthy ruler. It seems to me that he died unexpectedly and suddenly. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that I don't have time to talk about tonight that you will confirm for you the Bible. Now, I'm going really well. I'm on time. I'm going to land the ship. The destiny of Egypt was predicted thousands of years before they arrived. What would happen? This next discovery, you might come here tonight and you're not really sure whether you can believe all this stuff and I, I, I respect you, I actually am sceptical of most things people tell me. You tell me you saw a Tasmanian tiger, I'll say, of course you did. But I really want to see that. Why didn't you take a photo? You know, all these people that see this stuff, take a photo and then I'm more likely to believe you. So I'm naturally a sceptic. But what I want to show you next, if you're a sceptic, it will make you think. It will make you think. This discovery was a young boy, his name was Muhammad, he was a herder and the year is 1947, he's out with his goats around the Dead Sea, he's with his cousin and again there are different accounts when they asked him as an old man how it actually happened, he must have sort of got confused. What we're really clear about is that cave, see where this man is sitting here, right up above him there's a hole in the, in the side of the hill there. That's where they found those pots over there or replicas of them, the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
He flicked a rock, as the story goes. He flicked a rock into a hole. When I was a boy up in Queensland, there were cane toads around and we would uh, get rocks and we'd see a cane toad a long way away and we'd see if we could hit the cane toad. It was all quite legitimate to do that, okay. Um, we'd chuck rocks at anything that moved. Well, he had a sling and he slung it in there. When he went in there, he heard the sound of a breaking jar, just like those ones in the corner. I and mean, they thought, wow, what's in there? He and his cousin climbed up into that spot. That cave that's behind the man was actually dug later to see if they could find anything else in there because they realised they were worth money. Inside, he found these earthen jars. He and his cousin, they pulled the lid off hoping to find gold, but they find a smelly old piece of rag. They take it back to their parents. Their parents take it into trade in town, a guy that was, uh, that's what it actually looked like. And if you found that in your backyard, it would end up in the wheelie bin. You know, it wasn't anything too impressive. Worth far more than gold. But they didn't know. They took it in and uh, they, they took this scroll into a trader in town and a guy named Kando. Kando bought all of them he could for about $6. Six bucks American. He sold them on to an archbishop in Bethlehem there that was into scrolls. He sold them for $200, a whole heap of them, not knowing what they were. By the time an archaeologist named Albright got to unroll them and look at them, he said that they had made the greatest archaeological discovery of modern times. They had found the Dead Sea Scrolls. What's the big deal? The Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden when the Romans came into Palestine to trash the joint. The Essenes, they lived in a place called Qumran. They loved the Old Testament, the Bible, and they, they hid all their old copies of it in these earthen jars and put them up in caves and they were all killed by the Romans so no one ever was able to find them again. No one knew they even existed. But when they found them, the copies of the Bible that we had up until that point were, the oldest one was 1000 AD. In one discovery, we jumped 1200 years back in time to about 200 BC, 250 BC. At this point, you say, you're such a hard crowd, you know. <laughs> this guy, he said, big deal. Big deal. It is a big deal. Why is it a big deal? Just stay with me. They found over 1,100 documents. Uh, there, were, there were 233 manuscripts from the Bible. 40% of the scrolls were the Old Testament Bible. Inside of that cave, and that's the cave of the Partridge, by the way, that cave there, when they got back to camp and they said they found this and they got... You know, they got six bucks for it. They, they said, oh, we should find some more. Uh, one of the uncles of the boys said, yeah, I was hunting partridges and I shot a partridge and a partridge flew into this cave and I chased after it and I got the bird. And when I was in there, there was all these jars and I thought, that's odd. And he just walked out with a partridge. <laughs> you do what you do. And, and anyway, he said, well, I know where they are. So the next morning they go and that cave is still called the cave of the wounded partridge. They found hundreds and hundreds of jars and scrolls in that one cave. Uh, they found 11 copies of the book of Daniel. Tomorrow night I'm going to show you one of the great prophecies for the world that was found in that cave. Amazing prediction of what would happen to the world. These Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, are now kept in Israel. They are priceless, six bucks. A great scholar once said, if genuine prophecy is found in Scripture, the main issues of our age are met. I want to show you, tomorrow night is where I really want to blow your minds on what it told us about our world. I want to show you what it said about Egypt, Tyre and Babylon. Just some little insights that we know were not written down after it happened. We have copies now. This is the big deal. This is the so what. We have copies of these scrolls from way before the events actually happened. So we know that they are predictions. 
Well, did they get it right? Let me, let's have a look and see. I've got so much time, this is awesome. You guys can take 15 minutes, it's, it's cool. I want to show you just three of the predictions tonight to whet your appetite. By the way, on, on Saturday, I'm doing what the Bible predicted about the end of time. It predicted there would be a power come to the world called the Antichrist. I'm doing three meetings on it because there's so much prediction about it in the Bible. So you can know absolutely clearly what the Bible is saying is going to happen in our time. Let me show you what they said would happen to these nations because I think it's important. Um, I call this a tale of three nations. Let's have a look first. What does it say in these scrolls that were found in the cave? This is from the prophet Ezekiel. What did Ezekiel say would happen to Egypt? The place where they buried their little kings in solid gold. He said... I will bring them back from captivity and return them to Upper Egypt, the land of their ancestry. He says about Egypt, they will be a lowly kingdom. Now, I'm not saying anything bad about Egyptian people. Egyptian people, are, I've got some really good friends, they're still on Facebook, who, who, they're fantastic people. But the Bible said that that nation, which was the superpower of the ancient world, would become, in that translation, a lowly nation. King James says a base nation. It's not in the G7 today. Uh, it said plenty about them. It will be the lowliest of kingdoms and will never again exalt itself above the other nations. I will make it so weak that it will never again rule over the nations. And to this day, if you visit Egypt... The place that once buried their rulers in solid gold. Guess what's happened today? They are not, in fact, they don't have oil like the other Arab nations. You know, their main income is from tourism. And now it's got so dangerous that tourists don't even go there. And uh, the guys down the back, you've got some sound on my laptop, haven't you? When we were in Egypt, I tell you guys, crossing the road... Can you watch this clip. We were standing on a, a bridge filming a street in Cairo. There's a lady gets hit by a car in this clip if you watch it closely. This is what the traffic is like on a Friday afternoon in Glendale. Have a look. They have amazing road rules. Uh, a neat place to visit. I, I was going to hire a car. And then I got there and I said, no, 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 someone else can drive. All these thousands of years later, the Bible made a prediction. It's such a dangerous thing to make a prediction. We can't even predict the weather. We can't even predict what will happen in an election. Thousands of years ago, when it was the superpower of the world, Ezekiel says, two and a half thousand years ago, Egypt would continue into the future, but it would become one of the lowliest of nations. And unfortunately, they live on foreign aid to this day. Amazing prediction. Maybe they fluked it. Here's another thing that was found in the cave. The city of Tyre, which again was an amazing trading place in the ancient world. It was, um, it was unique if you go up... This is a, a Palestine. If you look right up near the top, there's a place there called Tyre. It's like the tyre on your car, kind of. Um, this is what the Bible said, the same prophet said about that city. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Tyre, and I'll bring many nations against you, like the sea casting up its waves. Tyre had done some really bad stuff to people. And God doesn't like it when you hurt and harm other people. It doesn't matter who we are. And Tyre had been wickedly cruel. And God says, 
I'm going to bring you down, Ty. This is what he said would happen. He says, uh, they will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down her towers. I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, from the north I'm going to bring against Tyre Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings. There's a brick in that cabinet up the back there with his stamp on it. It's a real artifact from two and a half thousand years ago. Nebuchadnezzar, real king. With horses and chariots, with horsemen and a great army. The Bible says that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was going to come and he was going to siege Tyre. But Tyre was a unique place. When Nebuchadnezzar came, he came and he sieged the place. He sieged it for years and years and he was going to starve the people out. But when they got through the walls of Tyre, guess what they did? They all got in their boats and went out to a little island. And when they were on the island, they poked their tongues out and made nasty names up about Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar couldn't do anything because he didn't have any ships. And Tyre, when Nebuchadnezzar left, they came back and they rebuilt the place and it was all fixed. And they said, God was wrong. The Bible was wrong. Tyre's just fine. Well, the prophecy, if you keep reading in what, what it says after Nebuchadnezzar, it says, they will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They'll break down your walls and demolish your fine houses. They'll throw your stones and timber and rubble into the sea. And in fact, in history... That is exactly what happened because a Greek guy named Alexander the Great came down, sieged the city, got through the walls. The people in the, in the city said, hey, we're, uh, we're out of here. We're going to get in our boats and go out there. And they went out on the island and guess what they did to Alexander the Great? And, and called him really nasty names and said bad things about his mum and all sorts of terrible stuff. <laughs> You can do that to some people and they'll go away, but you don't ever do that to Alexander the Great. So you know what Alexander the Great does? He gets the city, he orders his soldiers to take the houses and everything in the city and dump it into the ocean until he builds a road all the way out to the island. Exactly as the Bible had said. Exactly as the Bible had said. And... That, that was a causeway he built. I think they stopped calling in names when he was about halfway out. I thought, oh, uh, this isn't working as well as I thought. And in fact, if you fly over that place today and it's the home of Hezbollah, I wouldn't recommend you visit there. Um, you can fly over the city today and see that it's actually, that old causeway has now become a, a part of the the mainland and that island that they were hiding on is now part of the mainland exactly as the bible said would happen and that's what it looks like today um last one is babylon maybe they maybe the bible fluked it maybe it was a good guess we can all get things right sometimes babylon for me really is amazing it again um another handsome guy in germany there uh the, the tiles of Babylon, it must have been a beautiful city. Those tiles, two and a half thousand years old. And the Germans took them back and rebuilt the whole Ishtar Gate, the entrance to the city of Babylon. And uh, there's a line on the wall and, and all that groovy stuff. It was one of the ancient wonders, uh, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. What the Bible says about this city is very different what it said about any of the other cities. It predicted about Jerusalem, it predicted about Tyre, it predicted about Egypt. What it said about Babylon, I want you to read with me. It says, Babylon, that jewel of the kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the prophet Isaiah. She will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. And you can go there today. The, the uh, American army went to Iraq and conquered Iraq or attempted to and uh, had a lot of casualties and made a big mess of the place. This is what ancient Babylon looks like today. But this is what the BBC News reported when they visited there. Again, this is not a place I recommend you go for a holiday. It's rather dangerous for Westerners. 
This is what the BBC said, and this is back in 2008. Iraq's former ruler left the biggest mark, recreating his own version of Babylon on top of some of the original ruins. That was Saddam Hussein. He was going to rebuild the whole city, he said. Didn't work. Part of which dates back more than 4,000 years. Today, the site itself is peaceful, almost forgotten, with only a few sleepy guards and the manager there to greet us when we arrive. Just bear with me for one minute. This would be like me saying New York City is becoming a wasteland. No one will live there. Not even a stranger will pitch his tent there. The greatest city of the ancient world, the only one city that was bigger was Thebes in Egypt, had walls two car widths wide all the way around it. The Bible predicted in print, found in a cave in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that Babylon would remain uninhabited for the rest of time. The BBC reports in 2008, and tonight it's even worse than that. There's no guards there even. It's exactly as the ancient prophets had said. They made just as stunning predictions about our day. And tomorrow night, we're going to have a look at some of the artefacts that have been found in Babylon. Amazing discoveries. Some of the stuff over there, I'm going to give you some background on it. And we want to look particularly at the predictions they have made about our world. You do not want to miss it tomorrow night. For the sake of the people you love, you need to hear it because we live in incredibly serious times that have all been predicted and spoken of. I want to thank you for coming tonight. I want to end the meeting as I love to. I want to pray for you tonight. Uh, you want to ask about any of the artifacts around here, Ben will answer it or I'll, I'll attempt to. So let's just bow our heads. Father, uh, uh, you've shown your love for us. You've revealed to us through the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we just want to thank you that you spoke through these ancient prophets and you, you organized it so in that cave, all these great prophecies have remained hidden for thousands of years. And in our day, Lord, they've been discovered so we can say, wow, maybe there is more to this book than we thought. As we go home to our beds tonight and to our families, we just ask that we would go to sleep in peace, knowing that you have everything under control and things are going to end in the way that you determine. We thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.